The board and the board and the school district operate under applicable New Jersey laws and under regulations of the New Jersey State Board of Education. Each meeting in includes an opportunity for those attending to comment on items on the published agenda or other matters of interest to them. The board reserves the right to limit the time allotted to public participation. Law limits discussion of individual personnel and confidential matters. We desire that our meetings provide useful opportunities for communication between the board and the community. Thank you for attending. As required under the Open Public Meeting Act, NJSA 1046 at Sequentia, adequate notice was given for calling this meeting. It was authorized by the Board of Education and forwarded to the Municipal Clerk Princeton Packet and the Times on January 6th, 2021, and distributed to the schools and others on the standard distribution list. The board reserves the right to enter into executive session during all meetings of the Board of Education. Board Policy 2230 recording devices requires that we inform those attendings virtual Zoom meeting that the proceedings are being recorded. This meeting is not being live streamed. Public members who wish to make comment at the appropriate time, as noted in the agenda or added by the presiding officer, shall quote unquote raise their hand virtually at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Once called upon, the member of the public will be requested to unmute themselves by clicking the mute button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. The representative of the sending district is authorized to vote on such matters that affect sending district students or affect the governance of the Princeton Public Schools as more specifically designated in NJSA 18A 38A.1. In the event this statute is amended, the law shall take precedence over this bylaw. Sending district votes pertaining to personnel actions refer to high school, central administration, and district-wide staff only of votes otherwise are considered abstentions. I'll call the roll, if you will. Beth Barron? You're, you're muted, Beth. Okay, uh, Mr. Bolden, thank you for calling the roll. I'm present. Debbie Bronfeld? Here. Dan Dart? Here. Betsy Baglio? Here. Brian McDonald? Present. Michelle Tuck Ponder? Present. Peter Katz? Here. Daphne Kendall? Here. Susan Cantor? Here. Jean Durbin? Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. The first item of business is the adoption of minutes of March 16th, 2021. Could I have a motion, please? Brian, second, Jean, is there any discussion? If not, could we call a roll, please? Beth Barron? Yes. Debbie Bronfeld? Yes. Ann Dart? Yes. Betsy Baglio? Yes. Brian McDonald? Yes. Michelle Tuck Ponder? Yes. Peter Katz? Yes. Uh, did you skip me? Is that last? Uh... You skipped Susan. Susan, I think. Oh, was I not? Wait, uh, maybe it, was this the one yeah. I was at? I'm just, I'm just trying to think out loud. I think you were not. So this is March 16th. Yeah. yeah, I think you were not there. I was not Peter. there. That's right. I was not there. I was, I was COVID ill. You're right. I, uh, I abstain. All right, great. Daphne Kendall. Yes. Susan Cantor. Yes. Jean Durbin. Yes. Motion passes. Motion passes nine. A nine in favor, one abstained. Um, the next item is our student board members report. Uh, Maya Khan and Yash Roy, would you like to present to us? Right. Uh, hi, everyone. So we're just going to be going over the board report again. Uh, this time it is attached in the agenda and all of the board members have had time to take a look at it. So we're just going to, we went through the numbers, um, just give them very quickly um, one more time. So we had, 748 students respond to the survey, 22% uh, of which were freshmen, 24% sophomores, 29% juniors, and 25% seniors. I don't think those percentages add up, but that is the percentages that Google Forms gave us. Um, so the surveyed 49.7% were taking three or, uh, three or more AP or Excel classes. Um, and then 74% of the students were in the remote cohort C. Keep in mind that this survey was taken in February. Um, so I believe that number has changed and is continuing to change as Mr. Can Warren. I, can I just interrupt? Yash, did you want Matt to share the presentation? So you can uh, He it? can if he wants to. Yeah. Okay. He can, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want me, um, should I share it? Yeah, you can pull up the PDF. Okay, go ahead, keep going. I'll have to go and find it, no problem. All right, um, yeah. 
So uh, as I was saying, uh, about 75% are were cohort C, uh, of which 55% of freshmen are cohort C, 66% sophomores, 71% juniors, and 80% of all seniors are in cohort C. That number has changed, I believe, since this um, survey was taken. Um, the really important numbers that we believe come from the survey, the first one is that 86% of students felt overly stressed, uh, of which 76% were 76% uh, of freshmen said they were overly stressed, 76% of sophomores, 77% of juniors, and 90% of seniors. Um, 650 students reported that stress was due to academics or school, 275 for family, 59 for financial reasons, 312 about COVID-19 and just overall health. 116 for athletics, 329 students about extracurriculars, so clubs, um, academic teams, 437 with time management, 267, uh, 265 just about politics um, and everything that's going on in the world, and 249 students for friends. This category, people could choose multiple things. That's why there are so many different numbers here. Um, then on academics, 66% of students felt that their course load is too much this year. 53% uh, of freshmen say that, 44% say it's just right. For sophomores, 58% say their workload's too much and 33% say just right. Uh, juniors, 57% say too much, 29% just right. And seniors are 73% say too much, 27% say just right. Um, I imagine these numbers have changed as well. For seniors, uh, that number has probably gone up. For underclassmen as well, I would guess that it has also gone up. Um, and then another important question that we found concerning, uh, which is a number that we said before as well, is that only 51% of students felt that there was an adult at PHS that they could comfortably talk about for their mental health or other issues, and 48.8% said no. Um, and the great distribution is on the chart, so it was 47% yes, 51% no for freshmen, 47% yes, 43% no. For sophomores, 51 yes for 54 yes for juniors, 43% no, and then seniors was 51 yes, 47 no. Um, so, uh, and then Maya can do the screen time part, and then we'll talk about our implications. So, um, finally, on to screen times. When asked on average how many hours daily do you spend on a device, overall 35.6% of students responded that they spend nine to 12 hours, 30.4% um, spend six to nine hours. 19.4% spend 12 to 15 hours, 9.5% spend, uh, spend more than 15 hours, 4.6% spend three to six hours, and only about 0.5% spend zero to three hours. Um, when separated by grade, um, freshmen, the majority of freshmen spent within the range of six to 12 hours, and they have the least amount of screen time. Um, Sophomores spent slightly more time on screens with around 35% responding that they spent nine to 12 hours. Juniors responded that the majority spent within the range of six to 12 hours, but a higher percentage than previous grades spent 12 plus hours. Seniors have the highest screen time. Um, they spent, um, I think it was uh, three, uh, sorry, 33.7% uh, spent nine to 12 hours and 21.1% spent six to nine hours. Uh, and then 26.8% 12, spent 12 to 15 hours, 13.1% um, spent more than 15 hours and 3.1% spent um, three to six hours and 0% spent zero to three hours, uh, which is a significant difference from other grades. Um, and as Yash said previously, this uh, has probably changed um, since we did take this report. Uh, when we further broke this down into how much of this time is spent doing schoolwork outside of class time Zooms, overall students responded that 51.4% spent three to six hours, 22.3% spent zero to three hours, 90.1% spent six to nine hours, 6.2% spent nine to 12 hours, and 1.1% spent more than 12 hours. Again, um, we have similar percentages to before, just minus um, like the four hours spent on Zoom normally. Uh, so 50.6% of freshmen spent three to six hours, which um, is a significant difference from uh, when class time is uh, included. Um, sophomores responded that 51.1% spent three to six hours, is, so that is within the similar range. Uh, juniors responded that 44.4% spent three to six hours as well. Um, I mean, uh, which is a little less than before, uh, but also is uh, expected as juniors do have 
a little bit more course load. Um, seniors responded that 48.9% spent three to six hours and 23.3% spent zero to three hours. Um, but still they do have a higher screen time with um, class time, oh, without class time included. Uh, and these are definitely different from when we first took this uh, uh, survey before. Um, two other questions were asked, one specifically about class time of one hour start and uh, one hours and um, eight to 20 start times. Both of these questions have essentially been mooted out since we have been starting at 820 um, for the past couple of weeks, uh, which I believe that around like it was like a 50 50 percent like half and half of people who thought that 820 start times um, versus 920 start times should be uh, uh, changed. Uh, and we can start on the implications of the survey. Uh, the student body survey has a couple of really important numbers to keep in mind. First, stress levels. While stress is a regular part of life, especially in high school, 85.2% of students feeling overly stressed points to the difficulties oh. students are facing this year. Throughout the open-ended parts of the survey, students across the board stressed that they were dealing with a large motivation gap, with were struggling with the workload, and it was incredibly difficult to learn this year. A lot of these numbers and beliefs can be directly attributed to the pandemic. However, there are a couple of changes that can be pulled from these numbers. First, flexibility, as the school year is quickly coming to an end. Uh, Yash and I both believe that as a district, we need to stress a more flexible academic environment. Teachers are already working hard to accommodate their students and many of the students in this report told us so. One of the many questions in our survey is, what has been working well for you in classes? And many students responded with specific anecdotes of teachers having more flexible deadlines and providing more time for students to do work. Uh, this has also been accommodated through the uh, Fridays that have now been changed to um, more of like an office hours uh, instead of uh, doing more classwork uh, so students have more time to do their work another important thing student stress was more interactive work students specifically liked games and interactive teaching with apps and websites like kahoot jamboard and pear deck moreover stu many students stressed that they really enjoyed um, group projects as well as open discussions with their peers this year has been pretty tough so as the year closes out maya and i uh, yash and i believe that there should be a larger conversation to the way to decrease this feeling of being overwhelmed some measures have already been implemented with the new schedule yash and i have helped advocate for more office hours as well as a relaxed friday where students can catch up on the work as a large group of students in this survey stress how much they miss reading day fridays uh, and this has been addressed um, and students have been very um, given very positive feedback to this change. Another important facet of decreasing stress is making homework more static than the work um, the, than the way work is assigned right away. This means ensuring that homework isn't assigned at abnormal times like the middle of the night or early mornings, as well as standardizing due dates. Uh, I know this was also addressed um, with the new schedule changes of. Uh, the 8.20 start times on Fridays now. Um, moving forward, instituting more no homework weekends could also go a long way. Finally, another question we asked students was, what is working classes for you right now? And many students spoke about an excessive workload in classes that become difficult to follow as they were lecture uh, based instead of interactive. For example, students wrote about classes where work compared to last year has skyrocketed as more um, asynchronous work is being assigned to compensate for less synchronous time. And uh, just to cut in here, uh, Mr. Warren, since the survey has taken place, uh, wrote a note to staff, which has large, is largely being followed now to the institution of the new Friday schedule of um, this idea of static workload that students are no longer receiving assignments that are coming out on Friday and being due on Saturday or Sunday. So a lot of the stuff here has already uh, been dealt with and is being addressed right now. And that idea of flexibility, I think is the biggest thing which uh, everyone can pull from here. It's just this year is very weird for students. So just the idea of more flexible deadlines and more understanding which teachers are already being uh, will go a long way for students. And then, so the next part of our survey uh, ties directly into the idea of consistency and communication, uh, which is 
um, something that we've been, I think students have been pointing out for a long time. Um, and something that the school is doing better on in the last month is just making sure that things are sent out um, with a decent amount of notice. Given that the pandemic, we understand that things need to change very quickly, but still giving decent notice to people and decent understanding so that people can understand what's going on and so that they can move forward. I think one of the best examples are the iterations of schedules and everything. Um, the more time we have to process something, the better it'll go. And with this schedule, it has worked decently well, even though there was short notice, but um, just like going forward, I think that's pretty important, especially now we're getting to AP exams, um, which a lot of students at PHS take. Like, as you saw at the top, about half of students take three or more APs. I think if you do one or more, it's about 70, 75% of students. So just making sure that that information, as soon as it gets through, is explained to students will go a long way. Um, so the final uh, important, two important things was the idea of screen time and uh, human interaction. So a lot of the screen time issues is just we're on Zoom, hopefully as uh, more people are vaccinated, more people switch back to A and B, so the screen time decreases and the workload as we enter the last quarter, especially for upperclassmen starts to decrease a little bit as AP exams take place and fourth quarter for seniors. So this number will again go down and for human interaction, the guidance department is already setting up office hours with their uh, with their counselors and just there's already more interaction with clubs and sports. So hopefully this will also improve. So I think a lot of the things that you all can pull from this report is that there were issues and a lot of them have been addressed by our school and the administration and by the board through their actions. Um, and just going forward, I think the biggest things are the idea of flexibility and consistency um, and communicating and transparency. I think if those things continue through the end of the year, um, everything will work pretty well. So yeah, that is our report. We, are ready for any questions that you Thank you, Yash and Maya. That's a lot of information and we appreciate your sharing that with us. Um, do I have uh, questions from the board? Debbie? Yes, yeah, so I had this from last time. When we did the Stanford survey, one of the things we saw was that students didn't have someone to go to. And you guys just said 48.8% as a total. I don't have it broken out. And I know with the Stanford survey, we did a lot or we talked a lot with guidance and guidance was going to the middle school to meet with the eighth graders coming up and homeroom was doing more and the, the um, I'm sorry, PE teachers were doing more. And I know, you know, we're not seeing each other, but out of everything you put up, this is the one that really, really bothers me. And I know Ra, um, Barry, when you met with all the students, that was one of the um, bullet points you shared too. And I'm very concerned, like um, I'm, th this really makes me nervous because of a lot that's in the news and this and that. And so, you know, I'm asking you, Barry, also like, you know, how is guidance getting out there more and what, and, and now the kids are coming in, but you know, I'm, this is just horrible. That's half of our population doesn't have anyone to go to. And I'm just very worried about that in terms of everything happening. So thank you again for all your information. Um, that was the one that just really got me. Michelle, Michelle, Michelle. Her, she, she indicated that her, uh, her internet was unstable. Oh. Yeah. You're muted, Michelle. You're muted. Sorry, guys, and my internet's going in and out. My quick question, first of all, oh man. Should we come back? Does anyone else want to yeah, go? Come, yeah, I'll try okay. to put it in the chat. Sorry about okay. that. Daphna? Um, so Yasha Maya, thank you very much for um, taking the time to, to get this information and present it to us. Um, I have a question about screen time and work. So, um, and homework, right? Outside of Zooms. And are you saying that all the homework is uh, on a device? Because it sounds like, so like one um, answer you had was three to six, some students are spending three to six hours out of Zoom meetings on digital devices. So so are, are you saying there's no homework that doesn't involve um, screens anymore? I'm talking just from my personal experience. Um, no, unless I have an English book that I need to read, my other classes, and I think for across the board, most people are having to do their work off of a device, which compared to years before, since my freshman year, that's also been increasing the amount of time on screen. So it's not the most out of the world thing, but it is, um, most of the work is online. 
just because of the nature of the pandemic? Um, yeah, I think a lot of teachers do give the option for you to handwrite, but it still almost always involves some sort of device where like you're reading an article off your computer or you have like a PDF of your actual English book. Um, since I go to in-person school um, for a cohort, a lot of my teachers do give me like copies of books or textbooks so I can actually like read it um, or uh, like not on my screen. And I know students who aren't in cohort A or B or um, and they're in cohort C can actually go to school and get copies of books so they don't have to read it on their screen. But for the most part, it is almost always um, involving some sort of device. Uh, I know a couple of students who have taken um, their extra time to really uh, kind of that, like not use their screens and like write it down, but they say it takes a lot of extra effort, but they believe it's worth it. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering about books. Like we're on the agenda tonight, we're buying new AP science books. So I just, I just wonder, is it the classes you're taking? Um, or is it that this, I know Yashi said this was your experience, but is this, do you think this is reflective of, of the majority of students at Princeton High School? I think so. I think this year specifically, it is pretty representative that a lot, most of the work is on, like even uh, math textbooks are online this year, science textbooks are online. Um, like my AP Euro, and I know a lot of history classes are the same thing, the textbooks are online, you have to read it online. So uh, that's just the way it's going. I'm just going to read uh, Michelle's question. Um, it says she's asking, Yash and Maya, do you have any information on the demographics of the students who responded to the survey? For example, did you get input from special education students or students of color? We did not. We only got asked specific as grade and number of APs taken. Oh, so. Peter? Uh, thank you guys for putting this together. I, I appreciate it. And it's kind of, uh, I really appreciate the way that you guys have um, been really student representatives on our board. And I think that's an important, important feature. And so I, I appreciate that and your, your advocacy. Um, the screen time did pop up. I mean, for me that, that it seems like I didn't do the exact math, but more than a quarter of the students are spending between 12 and 15 hours a day on a screen. That is, I, I mean, I don't want to get too, you know, kind of philosophical, but that's untenable. I mean, that's just, that's a crazy amount of time to do anything, let alone be on a screen um, in, in one day, let alone 180 days of the year. So I think that's something that we need to address. And I understand that m much of this is kind of pandemic driven. So I'm not sure how much we, you know, take into the future, but it definitely is a, a trend we need to kind of at least think about. Um, my question for you uh, is, were you able to, you know, I thought it was also interesting um, kind of to piggyback a little bit on Michelle's question about the demographics that it seems like about half the people were taking three AP classes or more. Um, that seems to be kind of a, a, I don't say a skewed sample, but it certainly is a, a specific sample. And I'm just wondering um, if you broke it down and looked at the folks who are not taking that many AP classes, because I would obviously think kids who are taking that many AP classes are going to be stressed, are going to be online more, are going to be doing more work. That just seems intuitive to me. Maybe it's not right, but um, ha have you have you looked at the numbers and broken it down um, with regard to the, the those other kids? Yeah, so uh, we did look at it uh, between zero and three uh, and then three to five. So the screen time was lower. I don't know the numbers completely off the top of my head, uh, but it was slightly lower, but there isn't a very large change between the two groups. And I also think that from what I remember of the Stanford survey, uh, Stanford survey, I think it's about 40 or 41 percent of students take two or three or more Excel classes, Excel or AP classes. So PHS does have that culture of taking a lot of APs and stress. What? So it, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. What, what about the stress level? I mean, it, that number is one that obviously, you know, also pops off the page, but I'm wondering, is, is that also skewed to how many AP or how many accelerated classes you're taking? It was skewed again, but it's not a very, it's, um, I think it was seven or eight percentage points. So it wasn't a very large skew. Um, so I think that stresses across the board, um, people are, are overly stressed, so. Thank you guys very much. Brian? 
Yeah, I, I, I guess, um, well, I'll defer if there are other questions for uh, Maya and Yash. Mine was related to their report, but it's for uh, Barry and Bob. I think that's fine, Brian. Okay, um, so I'm just curious um, as our uh, leaders, um, how, how you process this information and what sort of filters to you through, through our counselors, through our, our, um, our guidance professionals. And um, I also know that we survey parents and have done that a couple of times this year. And I'm, I'm curious um, how aligned the results are on um, topics like the amount of homework and uh, stress levels or whether there are some gaps there. I think the I think the uh, the results and the survey are are somewhat accurate. I think we do have a number of students who are who are stressed and who are doing a, a tremendous amount of Zoom work in this pandemic. Uh, I think that was very clear in the three meetings that I had with students and uh, with uh, the the acting high school principal. Uh, you know, as far as addressing counselors, uh, I know Dr. Donovan and her staff have been reaching out to students to make sure. Uh, that students are comfortable reaching out to an adult, especially if they if they have needs. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, looking at the, the schedule, I think there were a number of student suggestions that were put in place for the last three months, three and a half months of school uh, that hopefully will reduce some of the screen time and some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, the stress levels. Uh, I think the students made a good point about when assignments were being uh, posted. Uh, which added stress to them at some point, and also the amount of, uh, and, and also uh, teachers adhering to the no homework uh, weekend policies, and uh, also taking a look at the amount of uh, tests that are due on certain days, and, and the amount of work that's uh, being requested um, during the week. So I, I think all these things in a pandemic have been exacerbated but I also believe that going forward, uh, they become really uh, points for us to take a look at when we set a plan for next year, even with in-person instruction. Students should not be spending five, six, seven, eight hours a day on homework. Uh, that's not healthy. Uh, that stress level cannot continue. And, you know, high school is supposed to be a time for enjoyment in addition to uh, preparing yourself for the next phase of whatever that career path is. Um, so I think, Brian, you know, this has to be, this is, this is, these are data points uh, that I think moving forward for the remainder of the year. And also as you, as the new administration starts to plan for future years, I think it needs to take a hard look at a number of things uh, so that students can enjoy their high school career and also achieve their individual goals of, uh, of doing whatever they want to do from a career standpoint. So I think this is an important survey. I think it's a data point. And I think it's something that the administration, the teachers, and the high school administration specifically uh, will take into account when they build their schedules and look at class loads and advise students on taking uh, the appropriate courses, which are going to necessitate uh, the additional time um, that a young, you know, that a student would have to be involved in in uh, in doing academic work. You know, there has to be a balance. Besides the academic load, almost all the students are involved in clubs and activities. Some are involved in athletics. Uh, so there's there's additional uh, time and preparation. Uh, Yash and I were speaking before the board came on, and the debate team were state champions, and we were just talking about you know. That and that's and that's a whole nother workload uh, for students who participate in these kinds of activities. And there are hundreds of students who participate in all kinds of activities, whether they be debate or or music. So to balance that high school life uh, and making it a healthy academic and a stress free life uh, is something that I think the uh, um, school administration has to take very seriously. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Glass. Uh, Dan. So the question I, I have just, is, uh, oh, Mr. Dart, before, uh, Mr. Katz, I just did the math really quickly for the stress, stress question specifically. So for kids taking APs from uh, zero, one, or two APs, the stress level was 82%. Overall, it was 85%. So 3% difference. Yes. 
Thanks, Ash. Dan, you were going to say. Well, the question was, um, you know, what standards should we have, uh, you know, for things like homework and stress levels, and what information can we get in, in real time so when they exceed our standard, we can make adjustments quickly. You know, we could send out, you know, a note to teachers, you know, we monitor this situation and we feel that uh, stress is too high with the environment we're in and, you know, please be conscious as you give out homework, but more real time data and feedback so we can adjust along the way instead of looking back at data that could be, you know, dated by the time we receive it. You know, what standards should we have? Uh, Jean. Uh, thanks, uh, Yash and Maya, for the great report. And I really appreciated having it in writing to look at it for a while. I wondered if you had any suggestions on whether or how we should change the culture in the high school regarding AP classes and the, you know, the need to take many of them as opposed to a select few. I know in the past, there's like a question about like, should we uh, completely remove or, or like have a cap on the amount of APs? And students were saying, oh yeah, that, that would be a great option. And then when actually asked on like the Stanford success survey, I believe overwhelmingly students said no to that. So I think it is something we could consider putting a cap on, but like students thought it would be a great idea, but when it actually comes down to it, I don't think students do want to put a cap on the amount of APs they take. I think students really enjoy taking a lot of APs um, and it's like a hard culture to get rid of. Uh, and it, it might be like, just like the high competitive, uh, competitive um, environment that we have at our school. Uh, I, th I think like if we could maybe ask, like do another survey regarding the, cu the culture of like AP classes and high pressure courses um, and see whether students have changed their minds on putting a cap on um, the amount of APs you can take. I know it is something that um, a lot of high schools do do and are uh, changing. Uh, so it, it's a it's a great question that we can see. So Barry, haven't you reconvened the AP committee? I we I have not. I don't know if Bob has has if that's going on at the high school or not. But I have not reconvened, reconvened the AP committee. Okay, sorry. In, interesting. If you look at the data, it um, it would kind of is counterintuitive. It's only a three percent difference, which is yeah, quite right. insignificant um, as far as a stress level. Anyway, I mean that there are other issues, but just from self-reporting of students, that doesn't seem to be it. It's also maybe self-selecting, but it's um, that's just an interesting data point because I would have thought the exact opposite. Also, uh, another thing, Ms. Durbin, I know Ms. Baxter before she left was talking about, or this was an idea that was also discussed that once you take a certain number of AP classes, you're also required to have a free period. Um, so that like can decrease stress, um, make life easier. So. For example, last year, my junior year, I did have a free period and I also took seven AP exams, which is kind of showing the way that our culture is not the best in the world. Um, but the free period was very helpful for me uh, with stress overall. So I think that um, that is also a discussion that can be done here. And I think so much of this is just driven by college. Um, college is that kind of like big bad monster that's lurking uh, after four years, especially in an environment like Princeton where overwhelmingly the idea is that you need to get into a good college and go to college. So I think just by the virtue of us being a stone's throw from the university, which is an Ivy League school, um, just the expectation of being an affluent place like Princeton, that contributes a lot to that. Um, I know in the next couple of years, as like test optional continues and all these things continue, that stress is going to exist or get exacerbated because admissions are getting even more competitive. Um, like this year was insanely competitive, next year will probably continue that trend. So the stress is here to stay unless there's some very radical change taken. Well, thank you for this conversation. And Dr. Glasso, you are meeting with the students now regularly, right? You have a committee? Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we have a monthly meeting uh, that uh, we've met three times and we're now waiting for a reschedule probably right after the, right after the spring break for a, uh, uh, <clears throat> an April meeting. I know Yash was gonna meet with the student council and they were going to decide on the number of students who would be meeting with the uh, uh, central administration and the high school 
uh, administration going forward. Okay, great. All right, so I think we're ready to move on. Thank you again, students, for your for your um, you know great input into the meeting. It's really important, and we're as I said, we're very glad to hear from you. Um, that brings me to my report, and I'm going to change the tone just a little bit, and just take a pause and for something quite serious. Um, we, the PPS Board of Ed, uh, join the Princeton community in mourning the victims of the shootings in Atlanta and acknowledge with the deepest concern the nationwide rise in violence, discrimination, and xenophobia directed against the Asian American and Pacific Islander or AAPI community. The most recent examples of racism and injustice directed at the AAPI community diminish the diversity of our community and serve as a painful reminder that we must announce all discrimination and stereotyping against Asian Americans. We all share the obligation to stand up against racism wherever and whenever we find it. The mission of the Princeton Public Schools to support the building of lives of joy and purpose and citizens of a global society. Strive to ensure that students of all backgrounds, cultures, and identities are welcome, safe, respected, and nurtured in our schools and community. We will continue to support AAPI students and staff and continue the work <coughs> to confront systemic racism in our district and beyond. Um, we're now going to take a moment uh, for some gratitude. Debbie Bronfeld, would you like to take over? Yes, 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 yes. So for our board gratitude moment, we would like to acknowledge Mickey team of nurses. We have Vera Maynard at CP, Liz um, Seifich at JP, Holly Javik at Little Brook, Sarah Goon Chan at Riverside, Kathleen um, Honiak. Honiak, I know I had this earlier, sorry. Cassandra Ortiz, Margarita Cruz, Lisa Smith, and Janelle Stuckey. We also want to thank our school doctor, Dr. Robert Helmrich, our partners at the Princeton Health Department, Jeff Grosser and Kathy Corwin, our local board of health, Dr. Meredith Hodak Avalos and George DiFeriando, for developing and implementing the health protocols that have made it possible for our staff and students to safely return to in-person learning and to keep them there. And today I had a firsthand view of our wonderful nurses at work. I, with many staff, administrators, and several board members received our first COVID vaccine under our nurses' care. So we all wanna thank you very much and appreciate that you were there. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And one more quick thing for my statement. I would like to directly address a petition that has been circulating in town that implies that the Board of Education does not understand the urgency of returning our students to normal in-person learning in September. This is simply not the case. The full reopening of schools in the fall is the top concern of the board. After spring break, with the help of tents, plexiglass, and very creative scheduling, we anticipate welcoming between 85 and 96 percent of our elementary students back into our buildings four days a week, as well as all sixth graders who choose to be in person, up to 75 percent of our middle school students, and up to 700 students at PHS, including approximately 300 seniors who may want to return for the last two months of senior year. Many families have decided to continue their students in remote learning, which remains a robust option this year. As for the fall, we will do everything in our control to bring back all PPS students. Potential, potential obstacles include the status of the pandemic and whether staff and students feel comfortable in person. And of course, mandates from the state of New Jersey, including the governor, the state legislature, and the Department of Education. As a, as a public governing body, the Board of Education is required to follow federal, state, and local law regulations and guidance. Community members can help us return to full-time school in September by reaching out to state legislators and to the governor's office to express their concerns and to urge state officials to provide New Jersey public school administrators as soon as possible with clear and specific guidance. Please see the PPS website and this meeting agenda for specific questions that would be helpful to have answered for us to plan effectively for the fall. We appreciate the Princeton community's strong and active support for public education and for our students who very much need to return to normal in-person learning. Thank you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Superintendent Galasso. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, in keeping with the, in, in support of the board statement regarding discrimination against the Asian American and um, Asian American community and Pacific Island, Islander community, a meeting has been scheduled for tomorrow between the Board of Education and leadership, administrators in the district and parents who are a member of the Asian American community. The Wednesday evening meeting will be a listening session. We wanna hear the community's concerns and recommendations on the topics of communications, curriculum, and student life. This will be the first step in establishing what I hope will be an ongoing dialogue between the Asian American parents and students and our administrators and faculty. I would like to commit our resources as a district to help our students and families feel safe physically and emotionally, and that we continue to move forward in our mission to diminish discrimination and racial stereotyping in our schools. With that, I would also like to provide the, uh, the community with a vaccine update. I am really pleased to, uh, uh, to, to report tonight that uh, with 1,000 vaccinations last Saturday, 1,000 vaccinations scheduled for this Saturday, uh, 150 uh, done in cooperation with our partners in Cranberry. Today, the um, Penn Medicine at Princeton, who have been a phenomenal partner in the last two weeks, providing over two or 300 uh, vaccines for Mercer County uh, teachers and staff. In addition to that, the um, Princeton Health Department. And I want to also want to thank some of the parents who sent us links that we were able to forward to our um, uh, teachers and staff prior to uh, us being able to organize a formal vaccination program. We have another pro uh, a vaccination program next Tuesday in Lawrence. And we believe after that, that all staff in Mercer County and all of our teachers who have wanted to be vaccinated are either uh, completely vaccinated or in process of being uh, receiving uh, their, you know, receive their first shot and then will receive their second shot. But I want to thank all of our partners. I want to thank the community for your advocacy. Uh, we now have our teachers and hopefully after spring break, uh, when we're returning our students to school and in, we're in person instruction, uh, we're doing it with, uh, with a faculty that's protected against the virus. And I want to thank again, all of our community partners. I want a, a special thank you to uh, Debbie Millar, who's the coordinator for the uh, Penn Medicine uh, at Princeton. Uh, she has been a ph phenomenal partner. I also want to uh, express my thanks to the Mercer County Education Association, whose lobbying efforts and support and organization uh, have made this all possible. So um, it's, a, it's a good news. Uh, our teachers are vaccinated, our staff are vaccinated, our kids are returning to school. And we're pleased uh, that the last two and a half months will be a return to, to as close as normal as we possibly can make it. I also want to thank our unions um, for joining together and providing assistance to the community and in food security. Uh, so we really say thank you. I know there was an article in the newspaper today uh, talking about their efforts, uh, but I wanted to acknowledge them tonight. So thanks to the three unions of the Princeton educational community uh, for uh, providing that food security for our youngsters is really needed. So once again, thank you on behalf of the entire community. Uh, I just wanted to echo uh, the, the school board president's comments with regard to school opening plans. Uh, if, you, if you're riding around our schools, you'll notice the tents are being erected uh, at the middle school, the high school, and our elementary schools. Um, on April 19th, uh, as Beth had indicated, we um, expect between 85 and 96% of our elementary students to be back four days a week. Uh, the middle school, we welcomed all of our sixth graders. Um, I visited the middle school yesterday uh, to look at the social distancing and also the plexiglass and the PPE mitigation standards that we put in place. The administration at the middle school is to be complimented uh, for the work that they're doing. The senior high school um, um, acting principal Warren and his staff have been doing a phenomenal job um, bringing cohorts in A and B together and forming a new cohort D. And as you had indicated in your comments, we're now reaching out to the 300 seniors to see how many of them would like to return to Princeton High School for the last two and a half months to make that senior year just a little bit special uh, with some in-person instruction and a chance to, to do some of the social, emotional, and participate in some of the senior year activities, which hopefully will be memorable for a long time to come. So I just wanted to uh, share that and indicate and reaffirm 
that the primary goal for September is to open in person. Um, I've asked Dr. Ginsburg to put together three teams of people at the elementary, middle, and the high school level. And their task is by June 1 to provide me three different plans, full in-person option, and then the plan for B and C, depending upon the variants of the, of the virus, any governmental changes, any, um, any reversal of a governor's position with regard to um, he said the other day, unequivocally, there would be no remote option. If there happens to be a change because of the virus um, um, surge or some sort of variant that they're not anticipating today, we need to have plans A, B, and C. But I, but I'm going to reiterate, our first option is full in-person instruction in September. We're getting our facilities ready, our business administrators working hard, uh, all the um, referendum work. Uh, is being um, is being pushed as quickly as the Board of Education can possibly do it. We do have some uh, facilities challenges, but they're being met. Uh, we're ready to bond. I'm sorry, we're ready to um, bid and award contracts for roofing and for other HVAC improvements uh, over the summer so that our schools are ready in September for in-person instruction. Uh, with that, we always, and it's been tradition since I've been here, we've always tried to highlight uh, one of our school programs. And tonight is no different. Uh, I would like to introduce our Supervisor of Science, Professional Development, Testing and Assessment, Merjula Baja. Uh, she works with all of our science teachers, K-12. And she loves, loves to share the amazing things that they're doing in the classroom. Uh, Merjula is a teacher and a chemist by training and she's passionate about science, but she's also passionate about equity. And tonight she's gonna to share a video from the middle school that will show how science teachers at Pooms work with sixth and eighth grade students to create the JEDI projects, which stands for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. So with that, Merjula, please. Thank you, Dr. Glasser, for the kind words and uh, for an opportunity to share with the board and the community our students' work. So one of our most critical practices, both as a district and as a department, is to explore equity and implement equitable practices in our classrooms. We have spent several years exploring our implicit biases and trying to understand the systemic racism that plagues our country. As educators, we recognize our responsibility to not only teach the content and processes of science, but to also recognize that our curriculum has not addressed diversity and inclusion as readily as it should. Keeping this in mind, we have embarked on our curricular reform efforts. One such effort is part of the APP or the Alternative Professional Project of our middle school science teachers who designed and implemented a research project called the Jedi of Science this school year. Traditionally, our curriculum has not intentionally addressed equity issues. This project is our first step in facilitating a shift towards more equitable practice. Our goal is to provide the mirrors and windows for students to see themselves in the science profession and empathize with those who struggled and overcame barriers to ultimately experience success within their field. Here is a video with clippings of student work, which demonstrates the interdisciplinary approach we adopted when designing the project. I hope you will enjoy the video as much as our students did working on the project. The Princeton Unified Middle School Science Department is pleased to share the JEDI project with you. Sixth and eighth grade science classes at Princeton Unified are making the connection this year to JEDIs, integrating the exploration of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion into our curriculum. The JEDI Research Project encourages students to explore and celebrate BIPOC excellence in STEM fields while learning about possible STEM career paths. Students select a JEDI to research and then share their lives, research, and discoveries through a presentation on the social learning platform Flipgrid. A grading rubric is used to provide detailed feedback to students. 
Here are some examples of the clever and original work that our students have produced. This is just in. We have an important announcement for all of you around You're the watching world. Delta Science News. I'm Waylon Del Hoyt, reporting live. Today, we will be having an interview with Helen Rodriguez Trias. We'll begin in just a second. Hello, everybody. We're so glad you could join us tonight. Let's move on to our first topic. Rodriguez Trias was born July 7th, 1929, New York City, United States. Died December 27th, 2001, Santa Cruz, California. Contributions United. of my dad. Contributions to science and society. One guy founded the Green Belt Movement in 1977 in Kenya. Nine trees were being planted for every 100 trees that were being chopped down. All the trees that were being cut down caused major problems in Kenya, such as soil runoffs, water pollution, making it hard to obtain firewood, and animals being deprived of food and water. Images of her contributions to society. My Jedi of Environmental Science project is on George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was born into slavery in Diamond Grove, Missouri in the early or mid 1860s and died on January 5th, 1943 at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. George Washington Carver was born into slavery and he and his mother were kidnapped in the Civil War. His owners, Moses Carver and Susan Carver, weren't able to find his mother, but found him and raised him as their own. Hey, we just got school. And then he went to the University of Richmond, on a food bowl, where he received a bachelor's degree in chemistry. And then he went to receive the master's science degree in materials, science engineering from the University of Virginia. Patricia Babb was born in Harlem with a mother and a father. She finished high school just two years in, but she decided to go even farther. She went to Charles Avenue and went to Hunter College. And she attended Howard University and earned a medical Women of science who are the smartest of all, rising up to the challenges of our world. And without them, society will always fall. And Patricia was one of the best women of science. Shadow Colts, what's going on? Observe that man had a bomb. A bomb? But how did he know? Well, it's all thanks to Betty Harris, an African, yes, an African American scientist born in Louisiana in the 1940s. She was the seventh of 12 siblings with a mother who encouraged all of them greatly to attend school, as the mother was a teacher as well. What does this have anything to do with the bomb? Betty Harris got a PhD in chemistry at the University of New Mexico. She became an expert in explosives and developed a test to spot exactly this type of explosive, the THC. Samuel P. Massey is a historical icon. He showed us that we don't need to be white. We don't need to have skin that's bright. We don't need other people's sights and opinions so that we might succeed in our lives. His story told us not to let anything stand in our way. Don't let your dreams float away. Grab a hold of them. Seize your day today. The 10 most important two letter words in the English language, if it is to be, it is up to me. Samuel P. Massey Jr. Thank you. And I'll just say, end with this, you know, the, the last line in that video, if it is to be, it is up to me, says it all. Thanks, Marjola. Thank you very much. Thank the students and the teachers uh, on behalf of the Board of Education. Uh, really outstanding. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the student survey and screen time. 
this is actually you know collaboration engagement um, and student involvement and, and and really all the standards are being taught um, with this engagement project so um, the teachers are to be commended along with yourself so thank you very much thank you that concludes my report thank you that was wonderful thank you dr Glasso. thank you Ms. Bajaj, that was amazing. Um, uh, Dr. Glasso, I think we have the school cool calendar next. Is that part of your report? Uh, well, yes. I'm just going to be recommending that the uh, you know we've had the school calendar uh, vetted for the last few months, and um, uh, we're just recommending that the uh, school calendar be approved by the Board of Education. Thank you. That's an action item. Do I have a motion for that? Uh, Bet Betsy, second, Debbie. Any discussion? Debbie? Yep, I just wanna bring up again that I would love to work with people to get voting out of our schools. And that way we also won't be going, you know, later and later into June. Um, our governor is making sure that we can vote in person in June. This June might be hard, but I just we find it ridiculous for half to have to school off. So I'm hoping <laughs> the council will come and want to work with us. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, Betsy? Just to note for parents watching, September 8th is the first day of school for students. And this calendar is attached to our board agenda, but I assume it will also be um, published to our website once it's approved by the board. Correct. Okay. Uh, Brian? Well, yeah, one uh, question is it still our um, hope and intent that in succeeding years, we will do everything in our power to begin the school year sooner. I know that's something a lot of people have talked about and um, I think a lot of parents would welcome that. Yeah, I think it's a stated goal. I think for next year, uh, that the reason we did not move in that direction, if you look at Labor Day, the lateness of Labor Day, the Jewish holiday uh, uh, that follows Labor Day, and in addition to that, you have a number of HVAC and renovate and referendum projects that are going to be um, uh, completed during the summertime. So it probably is in the best interest of the school district to open uh, with this particular calendar for next year and then look at future years uh, after your referendum work has been complete. Um, it's so to be sure the schools are ready for, for opening. Okay. I realized I misstated. It's actually September 9th this is the first day yes, of school right. for students. I'm yeah, sorry yeah. about that. Important trying, to, trying to do a public service announcement here and got it wrong. Okay, thanks, Betsy. If uh, there's no further comment, uh, Mr. Bolden, could you call the roll, please? Yes. Beth Barron? Yes. Debbie Bronfell? Yes. Dan Dart? Yes. Betsy Baglio? Yes. Brian McDonald? Yes. Michelle Tuck Ponder? Yes. Peter Katz? Yes. Daphne McKenda. Yes. Susan Cantor. Yes. Durbin. Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. Um, that brings us to our first public comment of the evening. Uh, we ask that the uh, if you would like to speak, you raise your hand in the in the in your screen, and Mr. Bolden will ca will call on you if you could state your name and your address, and please keep your minute, your comments to three minutes. Uh, that would be helpful, and we will be keeping time. Thank you. Oliver Huang, Huang? Hi, yeah, so um, I'm a student at PHS um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Asian hate crimes. So what we see at like Atlanta is kind of a reflection of just the fact that there has been a lot of Asian hate and just an Asian neglect throughout all of our times. And so I remember the first time, like I've been having Asian hate since I was very little. But I think one of the things that really struck me really hard was when I was in seventh grade and I was sitting in homeroom and I had someone in my class blatantly ask like as a taunt whether or not I ate a dog. And so it was like the most really demeaning. And the fact is whether or not I ate a dog isn't really like up for grabs because just because I eat a dog doesn't mean that I'm less human. That's incredibly ethnocentric. And I've had these racist spats go on and on since a lot of my times here at the school district. And I remember when I was in eighth grade, I had a kid, this was last year during the coronavirus, someone shoved an umbrella in front of my face and then just said, dude, it's to keep the corona away from you. And these things keep on going. And this is how like the hate 
that's been sewn all around us. And this builds up into people coming into spas and literally shooting six Asian victims. And also I'd like to lastly address the board's email about anti-Asian hate. Um, it was incredibly vague. And I think it's kind of emblematic of the fact that this board is not really doing a good job at communicating with the Asian parents and a lot of the Asian members of just the school in general. And it's also a greater concern that Asian people have been more and more angry that we've kind of been neglected a lot. And I think one of the ways we can see that is like in our schedule where even though we make up like a large percentage of the school's population, we still don't have Chinese New Year as a school holiday off at all. And it's kind of infuriating that like, even with our size, we're still not getting a holiday on. So I think I'm just gonna challenge the board to just do better and also for our school to actually address, you know, the eight, the Asian racism that goes on in our school every day. And even if it's like small things that aren't really violent, it's just kind of emblematic about how we've ignored Asian hate and kind of left it out. So thank you. Thank you, Oliver. I just, can I just say something, Beth? I just wanted to say, you know, apologize to Oliver that he experienced um, that kind of um, racism. And um, in New York City, I think it was yesterday, um, there was a video of someone beating up uh, a 65 year old, I think uh, Asian American. And there were bystanders there who just stood and took pictures. And I just think it's a reminder that we all, like you said, Beth, in your statement, that we all have a responsibility to speak out against this kind of behavior. Thank you, Jennifer. Dr. Rogart. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, first, I would like to thank Dr. Galasso for his tireless efforts in preparing for a return to full in-person school as soon as possible. I do want to point out some inaccuracies in the statement read by Beth. First, when referring to four days of in-school education for elementary school children, the public should know that these are actually half days, not full days. In other words, less than 50% of normal in-person school for, for our elementary school children. Why not five half days a week? Honestly, I have no idea. Second, current New Jersey law and guidance from the governor consistent with CDC guidelines does in fact allow for full in-person school, not just in September, but also now. So the guidance is there. In fact, there are more than 140 schools in New Jersey currently providing full in-person school, according to the governor. Third, I, and I assume most other parents who value their children's education and well-being, am offended by the statement that full in-person school in the fall depends on, quote, staff comfort. This is not consistent with state guidelines, not consistent with CDC recommendations, and in fact, in my opinion, is unethical given the preponderance of evidence supported by the CDC, reported in a great article today on CNBC, that distance learning is likely more harmful to our children than the risks of in-person education. Thank you for your time. And again, thank you to Dr. Galasso for his tireless efforts. Thank you. Renee Obergon. Hi, yes, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect, thank you. So Renee Obergon, 38 Walker Drive. Um, got two kids in the middle school, one heading into high school. I'd like to say that I'm very pleased with some of the moves that the Board of Education and the administration have done to open schools. However, there seems to be a disconnect between the actions and the language. And the language is what bothers me because it leaves me nervous about next year. So today there was comment about state mandates and there are no mandates um, you know, about not preventing kids coming to school. If you read the road back plan, um, there's no mention of mandates. It, it, all, all it does is make recommendations it provides guidance. It allows for modifications if you can't meet that guidance. We relied on the CDC for the six foot rule. Now that they've reduced it to three feet, we can't sit there and ignore the CDC guidance. So I just wanna make sure that, you know, we use our, the, the language that the Board of Ed uses very carefully, because again, it's sending very different messages to versus the actions and the actions I think are promising. But if you start using language that feels like you're leaving, um, wiggle room to, to go back, it's gonna put a lot of pressure on parents 
certainly myself, to really push against the board and, and, and try and make sure that, you know, come September, that there is no wiggle room. Because the most important thing is getting these kids back into school for a full five day a week class, no exception. Um, thank you very much for your time. And again, thank you for the efforts that you're making, but please make sure that the language matches the actions because right now they're not. Thank you. Anna Chalker. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for your time again. Um, what I'd like to um, uh, talk about is, is kind of some facts that we're, we're looking at, because, again, we want to always think about our public system and our public schools against other public schools that are uh, in our surrounding areas, because that's really who we should be basing all of our discussions on, not private school, public schools. And um, basically, last Friday, our children went into school on a Friday in person for the first time in 372 days. And I think that's a, an amazing achievement. And I thank the superintendents and the Board of Ed for letting that happen. But it's also a very large number of days for a Friday that children have not been in person school in the middle and the high school. I understand that the elementary have been going back five days, only half days. So I think, again, the, the language thing is, is important because when you make a statement that we are going back in person, we want to go back in person, full time um, education, it's got to be until three o'clock or 310 or have, when the bell goes, it's got to be everybody offered. And um, we need to get these children away from the screen time. You've seen with your report tonight, I mean, it's just staggering the amount of time high schoolers are spending um, on a screen doing work and homework that they're expected to do. So, and, and I, I don't, I'm not surprised that there isn't a, um, a huge discrepancy between children doing AP classes and children not doing AP classes. I think um, we need to really look at that. And I think that should be something that is on, at the top priority um, for the superintendents and, and the Board of Ed to look at. Um, and I would just like to see that we're working towards getting everybody back in front of a teacher, being taught by a teacher without any electronic devices. Thank you. Thank you. John McCann. Hey, how's everyone doing? Uh, John McCann, I'm co-president of PREA. Uh, and I just wanna thank the board, students, parents, fellow teachers, staff, and everyone who's in this partnership uh, of the Princeton Public Schools for helping to continue the learning of our students at a high level during these trying times. As a parent, I understand the struggle that families have endured during the pandemic. I wanna thank the parents out there and the sacrifices they've made to help with their students' education and to keep uh, everyone safe. So happy for the community support for teachers that we've been given. Um, everyone has faced many challenges during this pandemic and we continually meet them together. Uh, my mother-in-law passed away this December at age of 65 from COVID uh, unexpectedly. And there's so many countless people uh, who have been affected by this pandemic. In spite of all though, we've maintained school and students learning. Um, we have come a long way um, last June, our former district administrative leadership decided to retire in the midst of a global pandemic. And I really want to thank Dr. Glasso and the board for their leadership during these trying times. Um, Dr. Glasso had to navigate a really difficult, evolving and complex situation. Uh, this summer, there were three unresolved labor contracts and they all became resolved. The buildings are old, construction projects were taking place throughout the district and many buildings had poor ventilation. The amount of work to get the ventilation systems working, dealing with the space constraints, establishing safety protocols, ordering PPE, also ordering new technology and computers for our staff and students as well as training them on this new te technology while implementing a new learning management system was a huge lift. Um, it was an immense challenge that all district employees rose to meet and exceed. At the same time, we've been balancing the needs of 
not only in-person learners, but remote learners. And in-person learning began all the way back in October, which is a huge feat considering all these factors during the pandemic. Other districts in New Jersey were not able to open uh, some of them for in-person until January, even, even late as February. As teachers, we look forward to the expansion of in-person learning, welcoming back new students, the start of spring sports, as well as continuing the robust learning for students who choose to learn from home. To all the stakeholders, we welcome a continued partnership and moving towards what we all hope to be a more traditional school year starting in September. So thank you everyone out there. Thank you, John. Joseph asks, Hi, this is actually Megan Axe's wife. Um, I just wanna echo my agreement with some of the previous comments that were made um, in support of further in-person reopening. Um, I think that four half days in person are just not enough, especially for our youngest students. Um, it's, it's not clear why no Fridays, um, no, no in-person Fridays are happening. Um, and, and just again, that the evidence suggests that transmission rates are low in school, are only gonna get better as the teachers um, are vaccinated, which we heard earlier is happening um, in large numbers. Um, and just generally student health, I believe, and I think as we've seen in the evidence is best served by students being in person full time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are no other comments at this time. Okay, if there's no other comments. There was one. Uh, yeah, there is one. Yes, Dr. Rose. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, I wanted to go last to make sure other people spoke, but um, first of all, I, I do wanna thank everybody for moving forward. I'm so glad the kids are in school more. Um, it's really terrific. A um, couple of things I want to say is, I, you know, I'm concerned that the tents are terrific, but they don't work in the winter when the weather is poor. Um, so I just want to think about, well, what's going to happen in late October and November um, when it's cold or when there's a lot of thunderstorms or what, what's the plan for then? Um, so I think we need to be thinking about that. Um, I'm really concerned that the middle school is still mostly Zoom when the kids are in person. The middle school, I, I'm so frustrated with the middle school. The kids are really on hours and hours in Zoom when they're at home, and they have hours and hours of Zoom when they're at school. Um, and it's really bad for their attention. It's bad for their development. It's just, I, Personally, I think it's terrible. So I just have concerns about that. Um, and I wanna reiterate what some of the other speakers said. The board continues to say that recommendations from the governor's office are laws. Honestly, Beth, they're not laws, they're recommendations. You really have to read the document. And when you look at the document, there is some leeway based on what each school is able to do. Um, and I think the board ne needs to really look at that and stop telling the public that they are laws. Their recommendations, some of them don't have any leeway, but many of them do. And the board has chosen not to have like leeway within these recommendations. Um, so I think that's really important as we move forward that we really flesh out what do we have to do and what do we have some leeway with to do what's best for kids? All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Can I mute? Justin Matthews. Uh, uh, hello, Justin Matthews, sixth grade social studies at the middle school. Um, I, I just want, I wasn't planning on speaking. Um, but I just wanted everyone on the panel to know, on Monday, I welcomed 18 students back into my room, first period, first block, and one student remained online. I spoke privately with that student, and I said, do you want to be on the big screen the way that we have always had the Zoom students in my room? Being a shy student, she said no. 
my other students who I didn't require to be on Zoom found out that there was one student who would be on Zoom by herself. And this, one of the students said, there is no way she's being by herself. Let's all log on. I was so proud of my kids that, that moment. Um, I'm trying really hard to get my kids off of Zoom. But as long as we have kids at home, I don't know how we can leave them there without the rest of the students. Um, so my students made me proud this week. Um, and we've welcomed back more sixth graders than we've ever have. Uh, and I'm ready. I'm ready for next year. I'm ready to bring them all back. Um, but my kids made me proud this week. And I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, there are no other comments at this time. Okay, then we'll move on. We are in um, I-1 of the agenda, harassment, intimidation, and bullying. It's a consent item, so we'll go through that one. And that takes us to the board committee reports. Um, and there we start with equity, and I believe that Debbie is going to give that report. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the equity committee met on Monday, March 8th. Mr. Burr gave an update on the Pooms renaming project. Mr. Burr shared with the committee that the website to view the student's nomination was live and he explained the voting process and the plan to present names to the board for discussion. The committee presented the themes that emerged from the February equity Jamboard activity. They were grouped based on three categories, instructional, structural, and cultural beliefs. The meeting again broke into small groups with the overall focus continuing to define equity for the Princeton Public Schools. The focus was on culture at Princeton Public Schools and we discussed possible barriers that must be acknowledged and must, I'm sorry, must be acknowledged based on the district so we can move forward at the elementary level, the middle school and the high school level. Ideas from the breakout room were shared with the whole group. Our next meeting is Monday, April 12th, which is right after break at 7 p.m. All are welcome and it's been a great discussion. So we would really love to have you join us. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Any questions? Next, that makes, uh, we're going to operations and that will be Susan and Brian. Um, I'll be very brief. Our last meeting was March 10th and I'll throw it over to Brian. But in terms of the facilities, we received an update on the referendum. We um, discussed uh, the possible pool um, bids that we're gonna take to make sure that our HVAC for the pool is operating uh, in the long term efficiently. Um, we've discussed um, RFPs that Matt will be sending out for the board to see uh, in future meetings and possibly approve for this summer's work for some small to medium sized projects that we're gonna try to potentially do um, this summer. Um, and then I'll throw it over since more of our meeting was for the budget. Hey, Brian. I, yes, we did have a robust conversation about the budget. And um, the results of all that were presented by Matt um, at the budget, budget um, presentation when we adopted a tentative budget for the year with a 1.025% um, increase uh, in the overall tax levy. Um, and uh, Matt and the committee will be working um, before we have to adopt the final budget to see if it's possible to do better. Um, one of the challenges, which is also a discussion topic, are uh, opportunities that might exist for us to do more to control um, the growth of healthcare expenses, which have been a challenge um, for every district throughout the, the state to manage. Um, and that's something that Matt is um, uh, spending a lot of time thinking about. Um, and I think that uh, those are the highlights. Okay, thank you, Brian. Is there any questions? Uh, if not, we go to personnel and that's Michelle Tuckbonder. You're muted, Michelle. Sorry, go. I'm having technical difficulties tonight. I'm on my phone. Um, <laughs> so our last meeting of the personnel committee was on March the 3rd. And I will confess to being new at this. And I, as you may have guessed, many of the topics we talk about at personnel 
are confidential. So I'm going to share with you um, what I think is not confidential and um, hopefully I'll be right. Um, some of the issues that we talked about during that meeting were about spring break and quarantine following the spring break. Um, we had an update on the PHS principal search. And um, we also um, had conversations about um, staff adjustments and filling um, certain roles. And our next meeting is going to be this Thursday, April 1st. And it's not open to the public. So thank you, Michelle. The report. Okay. Um, next is policy. Jean? Uh, thanks, Beth. The policy committee met on um, March 19th. Uh, we discussed policies for review on first and second read. They're, they're further down in the agenda tonight. Board governance and advocacy issues. Um, for board governance, we're working as a board on committee charges to help us focus and frame our work. Um, policy issues, we uh, referred an anti-racism, anti-bias policy to the equity committee for um, recommendations and direction. Um, Conduct and discipline policy will be referred by Dr. Galasso or has been already to his administration staff and students for review. Um, and recommendations for our next meeting include uh, exploring advocacy opportunities to support full reopening, exploring opportunities, uh, continuing to support teachers and all staff being vaccinated, um, uh, advocating for additional state and federal funding, and um, continuing with the regular policy review cycle to make sure that we're um, that we have the best policies that fit with our mission. Um, and our next meeting is uh, April sixteenth at seven thirty a.m. Thank you. I have uh, one here. question: What was the one you sent to Equity? Oh, so it's just a question for Equity on how we move forward on an anti-racism, anti-bias policy. I think we you have know, an anti-bias policy, but. An anti-racism okay. policy. Okay. Are there model policies you'd like for us to look at? I'd love to find some. Yeah, okay. uh, that, that would be great. But we, I didn't want to assume it's it's for equity to decide. I, I know I'm a member of equity too. Right. But um, okay, yeah, great. So we, didn't know about this. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Just, maybe you can follow up with that off. off Perfect. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Hey, I just have a question about um, how a policy. Uh, who, who decides the policy is getting updated? Because as you know, we had a policy that was uh, totally incorrect and um, came from NJSBA. So are they telling us that we need to update these policies and then not giving us um, you know, the correct wording or is this something that we're deciding to do? Matt, do you wanna to speak to that one? Can you uh, ask that again? I'm sorry, it was one of the board members was asking me a question. Yeah. To it was a well, maybe Barry can speak to it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, Matt. I think I think what uh, the Daphne is referring to, when the board switched from uh, one service policy service to NJSBA, they you they did a rollover. Um, now, from what I can tell, because I wasn't here when you did it, but from what I can tell, uh, they probably missed about fifteen or twenty policies in the rollover. So now they've gone through the policy book. They did an audit for you, and they changed the pronouns. And then they did an audit and they said, oh, wait a minute, these policies didn't, didn't roll over from the previous policy service. So some of the policies that the committee is dealing with currently are policies that they are recommending because they're either mandated or statutorily required. And therefore, we, they should be included in your policy manual. So that's how that's being handled at the moment, Daphne. Once that is complete, then the policy committee will go on a regular schedule. Typically, school districts look at the 100 series, and then they move to the 200 series. And periodically, you get recommendations from your policy service because either a uh, uh, either the policies change, the laws change, or there's some reference that's changed, and they're advising you of that. And then you have the option of adjusting your policy or not adjusting your policy. Right. But we had a policy that was on was going to be Correct. on the agenda. We had a policy that they sent to Matt, and they sent the wrong edition. So mm -hmm. when he edited it and when we reviewed it, something didn't sound right. But eventually it was NGSBA sent Matt the wrong version. Well, right, because I emailed you because that's Correct. a subject right. near and dear version. to my heart. They and sent we the wrong version of the policy. Right. So, I mean, that's your policy service that 
you know, unfortunately they made a mistake. So can I further on that? Cause I had sent a bunch of comments too. And then I wrote to the policy committee and said, what happened? So maybe, because we had, you would ask Barry for us to send you comments. Right. So maybe if things are not on, if we could be told because ladies, ladies, we answered that by email. It's pulled from the agenda. You were aware of that. We had email correspondence about it. Excuse so me. it's not on it's not on the agenda. I tonight. understand it's that, cool. but I spent was a I'm just saying, I'm following cool. up with what Daphne said. Like it was well, very correct odd. It. it was very odd. Well, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm, it I'm, be corrected. Right. My concern is with the NJSBA, right? Because we can't, we don't have the bandwidth to go through uh and be aware of all the laws. Yeah, that's a good concern, Daphna. I think yes. that. We're now on notice and that that can happen. And I think I think the board has had concerns since you made the switch, um, yes. but you now have them as a policy service. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think now, you know, we're just going to have to work through some of the issues that uh, that are presented by using them. And this is one that we're going to have to be constantly aware of to make sure that we get the most updated policy for review when they send it to us. And so it was, it was a good it was a good catch. And, and the switch was started way back when, before most of us. Oh, worked, right? right. Yeah, we used to have Strauss Esme, and then for whatever reason, somehow it, there was a decision to switch it. And and yep. so, during my th last three years up on the board, we've been yep. transitioning to the NJSBA, and now we finally have finished. And now we're like, well, we we have some concerns, so we have to keep watching that and decide what we're going to do. It takes a long time to switch back and forth. Yeah, I just think it's also important to, in my experience, the value, like NJSBA writes for every school district, right, New Jersey, and our values might be different. So I just think it's important um, just to yep. be aware of that. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any more discussion about policy? If not, we'll go to student achievement. Daphna, and you're up. Okay, so thank you. The Student Achievement Committee met virtually on Friday, March 26th. The first item of discussion was a result of parent surveys that were sent out to elementary, middle and high school families. Dr. Ginsburg reported that most parents felt that in-person learning was more effective than remote learning. Parents across all grade levels cited positive support from teachers in regard to student needs. Finally, the survey responses indicate that students in the middle and high school are still not getting enough sleep. Uh, more than a few parents reported their middle schoolers are getting four hours of sleep. So that was concerning. Uh, the next item for discussion was just presented here tonight. We talked about the Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Program, nicknamed the JEDI Program. Um, uh, the purpose of this program, as was said, is to help uh, have students explore BIPOC excellence in STEM, learn about STEM career paths and contributions made in the field of science and technology. And we also watched um, the video of the outstanding student work. Uh, the next item we discussed was a new biology AP book, which is on the agenda for board approval tonight. Uh, the AP, the college board requires that we um, replace these books every 10 years. Um, Marjula Baha and her staff uh, concluded that the Campbell AP biology textbook was the most inclusive of all the books they reviewed. And they shared many pages with the committee and it looked definitely uh, inspired us to th learn science. Finally, we discussed summer programming and we should have more information to share with the public in the near future. The next SAC meeting is on April 23rd at 9.30 and the public is welcome to attend. Thank you. Is there any questions? Uh, if not, uh, I, negotiations, I'm assuming there's nothing for the public tonight on that. Uh, only uh, that we have, we have two contracts that are expiring uh, June 30th and we're working diligently to you know, ensure that they're renewed. Great, thank you. So that will take us on to K-1 policies up for first read. And those are all a consent. Any, yes, Debbie. Um, so I have a comment on 3542. The part about, and this has been an issue for a bunch of years, the part about um, if the students who are on free reduce and they don't choose all the items, they get charged a la carte. And we've had problems at the end of the school year where students are free and reduced had balances and I do remember there was a child who was afraid to tell his mother because she knew he, he couldn't pay. And um, I'm just wondering about the wording and about what the training and kind of where we go from here because my what I would rather them do is take all four things and then have a share box or put it in the trash. It doesn't really matter because the law makes free and reduced take to a certain amount. And if you don't, you get charged a la carte. 
And that is the worst part about it. So I struggle with this one. Um, and I struggled the last time we've seen it too. And so I don't know where to go with this because I hate the fact that, you know, if we have free and reduced and they end up with um, charges. Uh, Debbie, where in the policy are you are you looking at? 3542.1? Yep, under breakfast, under lunch. It's the last paragraph. No, it's, it's just 3542. Just, yeah, 3542. I said it's, that. It is part of the statute. Um, the food general. service. I know it says if students do not choose enough food items to compromise a um, reimbursable meal, a la carte prices will be charged. And this, this happens and students who are on free and reduced have um, a balance they have to pay. So since I've been here, so that is an issue. And yes. we and her staff work with the students to let them know to take the whole amount. We have talked about sharing. Obviously, it's not the best time while well, we're not eating in school. But um, we've also generally uh, not. If they're free and reduced, we read off the balance. Um, for the most and we part, have to have the language that way. You well, said that that's statute. the language. It's it's part of the whole uh, school lunch program. They want children. Did you want to add some, Doctor Golasso? You're muted. You're muted, Barry. I think you have to be very careful with the language. I think your practice can be different than the language. The practice is one of the a, a human, humanitarian. The policy, I think, is uh, required under the child nutrition laws and for us to get the appropriate reimbursements. Am I not correct, Matt? That is, that is correct. And basically, that's what we do. And we work with the kids to let them know they don't have to eat everything. But there is from time to time. Um, and, you know, as we were just kind of talking about when you pointed out, you had some good comments on the policies. Then I realized that the statute was outdated. They, they hadn't updated it, uh, but there were some interesting points there about the, uh, you know, um, about the policy that he pointed out. So I, I did take some of the language from strauss Esme, but yeah, we are controlled by the statute. Uh, but sometimes some of the issues were, if, you know, a student, so the, what I was trying to say is when the statute was updated in 2018, they even made it more important not to stigmatize those students that are on free and reduced lunch. So, you know, if a student comes up with the, the slice of pizza that's, you know, a la carte, so that's a constant issue. You know, we, we don't take away the pizza, they, they put the charge through, but we try to educate the children, you know, without stigmatizing them. So it's a, it's a constant battle. We're doing a decent job here, um, I think, overall. And you know, last year, since I've been here, we've written off um, balances. If the families are free and reduced, um, it certainly would not be feasible to try to, you know. In, as you guys know. in the elementary schools, at least when I was there and we were serving lunch, uh, we actually did what, what Debbie was talking about. If children didn't eat stuff like it or didn't use a milk container, it was put up on the stage in a big bin so other kids could take an extra meal. Obviously, if it wasn't open, if they didn't eat an apple or something, that was placed there. Uh, so the things that were able to be done, we did share with, um, or you know, kids could get seconds. So it was actually the the lunch workers, the 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 uh, cashiers, who were the ones who we trained to encourage the kids to put everything on their plates so they wouldn't be charged more for less than than other would otherwise would happen. I just, I just want to highlight it because it, it's, it's something that, you know. It goes back to what Barry said. That's the more humane way to right. deal with it. Can I just make a suggestion that maybe this could be brought up in operations, but the, this policy, the food service policy, which, just to Debbie's point, which is 3542, um, and it says no money shall be transferred from Princeton Public Schools to any other account or fund except it's authorized by the board. And I wonder if the, some, you know, the board could consider, consider this in some meeting, whether or not we can um, pay those charges. So in a, in a case where a student doesn't, doesn't take, takes an a la carte meal as opposed to the full meal and then gets a charge, is, can we look into the board covering those charges? Sounds like that's, that's what, we're what we've been doing in practice. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have fund balance available, mm -hmm. and as long as the amount of those charges is not uh excessive you know it's a constant balance between you know so that essentially is is what happens now 
So yeah. one of the other statutory things that you can't take with the, the money out of food service for other funds too is also yeah. what they're getting at. Everything has to stay in. Everything spent in the cafeteria fund has to be for the providing of uh, food and food health and wellness uh, related to the uh, student population. And I know at the high school they've asked um, parents at the at when their children are graduating if they want to make a donation of their balance to help other students, and that has been happening for the last couple of years. And then that money is being used um, to satisfy these these debts as well. Right, Susan. Maybe at the middle school, um, Matt, you could follow up with the comment that we have in the chat from Mr. Matthews um, offline. It looks like there's something there to be sorted out. Um, that takes us to the uh, policies for second reading. Sure, can well, can I, I, can I, um, sure. can I unmute? No, you're there. No, not, you. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so I just have a, a, a comment about um, the use of school facilities policy 1330. And, and, and it's kind of a broad overview around the use of school facilities. And, and as many of you know, um, I've, I've been in, involved in Girl Scouts my entire life. I used to lead a troop in the um, John Witherspoon neighborhood. And one of the things that really used to make me very, create a great challenge was kids who went to community park school, we could not have Girl Scout meetings in that school. And, and the history and culture of Girl Scouting, Boy Scouting, and a lot of organizations that have saved a lot of kids' lives, um, they've been attached to the school. And so the difficulty of being able, first of all, to even know how to request to use the schools before I was on the school board, and then um, being subjected to you know, a, a lot of requirements was really onerous for community-based organizations, um, which may be national, but are really serviced by volunteers um, to have facilities to help the kids who attend our schools. So I just wanna, you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking through this and I run a, a youth development program and it meets in schools all over the country. And I just wanna be sure as, as, as important as it is to protect the district and to not um, encumber us with costs and to uh, make sure that we're protected from liability and all those kinds of things. In our effort to do that, we have to make really sure that um, we don't make it so onerous that we discourage those organizations from serving our kids in town. And I will also say about voting, because I know one of my colleagues will disagree with this vociferously, but there's no, from where I, from, from where I sit, one of the most important things we can do is to show our kids um, the right to vote and consistently demonstrate that to our kids. And in a country and at a time when there are so many efforts to prevent people from voting, I think the last thing that I wanna be any part of whatsoever is to participate in any activity that's gonna inhibit or make voting more difficult for the people in the town where I live. So I just wanted to make sure I, I said that when we're talking about the use of facilities. Can I just comment, Michelle? You know, I would never do that. You know, it's more so we can go to school. And you know, we keep the kids so separate from the voting these days. I mean, it's even worse. They can't do gym class if it's a rotten day. Yeah. So. I, I know that's not your intent, but if the outcome is voter intimidation or prohibiting people from voting, we got to figure well, it we out. Because that, yet, that so. can't stand. No, of course yeah, not. I would never. Stand. I would never, and we oh. haven't even gotten that far. No, I haven't been able to talk to anyone yet. I want to bring us back to the policies. And there was a specific question about a policy Michelle just raised. And I think that Matt, in that policy, there is a definitely it addresses nonprofit organizations and you have the ability to definitely make, have discretion to uh, waive fees and that type of thing for nonprofits, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. So Michelle, there is an ability in there. The question is, if you feel that there's a communication issue, maybe we should talk offline about that with Matt. Well, there is, because if you're a Girl Scout leader and you have to come in with a 501c3 letter and a certificate of insurance and all those kinds of things, again, we can look at the practicality of how that gets implemented, but I wanna say from personal experience, it is really difficult to, to do that kind of volunteer activity in our schools. 
and it's not there's not clear direction on how it gets done. So hopefully this policy will help clarify some of that. Thank you. And one one other quick question. So the policy's up for first reading. I know some of these were just redone with the um, policy manual. So how did these five come to the forefront? Are there changes? I know we started to talk about it, but for example, the community complaints, is that a new policy that came through NJSBA? No, they were policies that during the transfer. That never made it, okay. That never made it. So now there was a list, I think there were like 16 or 17 on the list. Got it, sorry, and, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I know you asked that earlier. Thank you, Betsy, for asking it beforehand as well. So thank you, we didn't get that back to you. Um, okay, uh, I think we're on the second reading policies. Any there you wanna talk about? All right, then we're gonna go through personnel and I'm gonna go quickly and you can stop me if you wanna say something. L1 appointments, these are all consent items. Transfers and reassignments, retirement. I wanted to say something. Yeah. Um, just about um, Ms. Bursta, uh, my children didn't take Japanese, but I've only heard um, great things about what an exceptional teacher uh, she's been for our kids. So just wanted to wish her well in her retirement. Thank you. I also wanted to note that the last in-person event I attended at, at PHS was the Asian Fest last year. And I was so moved to, to see the Japanese uh, uh, language students doing a dance and there must have been 60 of them all at once. And it was just incredible to, uh, to see. So uh, obviously there was some really wonderful things going on in, in, those, in those classes. So we will, we will certainly miss, miss her. Um, resignations. Personnel items, leaves of absence, curriculum and instruction, student services, EPES, substitute teachers. A question on EPES. Matt, is that coming out separately? No, the athletic EPES, the next yeah. one. Oh, sorry. Yep. The next one is action. Uh, and then athletic EPES is an action item. Can I have a motion, please? Uh, Daphna, second. Uh, Susan, uh, could we have a roll call for that one? But I have a comment. Okay. And I, I don't know if Brian still does. Um, I just want to say it's really fabulous to see some sports for the middle school. And I really appreciate the coaches that are doing it and everything. I know that's been something we've been trying to, that we've been talking about. So I'm happy about that. So I just wanted to um, ask a question since this didn't come um, to personnel. Mike, um, are most of these, um, how, many, how, how many coaches did you have to get from out of the district to staff the programs? I don't have those numbers handy. I'd have to look, I can report at personnel committee on Thursday if you'd like. Thank you. Okay. You wanna call the roll map? Absolutely, Beth Barron? Yes. Debbie Bronfeld? Yes. Dan Dart? Yes. Betsy Baglio? Yes. Brian McDonald? Abstain. Michelle Tuck Ponder? Yes. Peter Katz? Yes. Daphne Kendall? Yes. Susan Cantor? Yes. Dean Durbin? Yes. Motion passes. And that brings us to the settlement agreement with PRESA, another consent item, a sidebar on spring athletics, middle school seventh period coverage, a suspension of staff member, and then we're in M1 NJDOE preschool expansion aid, textbook approval, N1 professional consulting services, N2 professional consulting services, N3 Invo healthcare, N4 educational placement, and then O1 financial reports, O2 renewal of transportation contract, O3 renewal of athletic transportation. 04 emergent purchases, 05 exceptions of donation. And here I just want to note we're receiving with gratitude a uh, donation of a, a, a brain specimen. I thought that was interesting. So thank you for that. Um, 06 fire and evacuation drills, 07 registration and travel agenda. And then that takes us to our second public comment on any topic. Again, if you would like to speak, please uh, raise your hand in the chat, in the Zoom. Uh, we ask you to keep it to three minutes and state your name and address. There are no. 
are no comments. If there's no comments, we are on to the consent vote. And Matt, do you want to um, call the roll? Oh, no, excuse me. Can I have a motion for that? Uh, Jean, second. Um, Brian, any discussion? If not, you could call the roll, please. Beth Barron? Yes. Called me, Debbie? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Betsy Bagwell? Yes. Brian McDonald? Yes. Michelle Talk Ponder? Yes. Peter Katz? Yes. Daphne Kendall? Yes. Susan Cantor? Yes. Dean Durbin? Yes. Consent to agenda passes. Thank you. Um, I think that brings us to the closing comments. I would like to ask Dr. Galasso, do we have a meeting on April 13th? Is that our next meeting? We have a I believe, tentative, uh, right? Tentative meeting on April 13th. Okay, we haven't yet finalized that one. No. And otherwise our next uh, monthly will be April 27th. And if there is no other matters to discuss, um, could I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, Daphne, second. Susan, thank you. All in favor, show of hands. Thank you, uh, motion passed unanimously. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Good night, everybody.